You want the experience, comic culture, and sales. Streaming live daily to Facebook, YouTube, Twitch, and Twitter. Hey, 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 everybody. It's Christopher, a.k.a. the Bronze Age Nerd. And you know what's interesting is over the last few months, I've been dealing with a lot of, I guess you'd call them personal problems. Everything from mental health to struggles with just day-to-day stuff that I have going on when it comes to being organized and getting content out there. And there's one thing that kind of keeps drawing me back to being online and talking about comic books with people, whether it's on a YouTube channel like this or or Instagram or X or wherever you're watching Twitch, um, or even in just social circles, talking to people about comic books um, or things going on in the comic book scene, you know, Discord servers and private chats and stuff like that. And coming back and hearing all those people so excited about talking about those things keeps bringing me back. In other words, it's the community that I'm here for and rally around. And the reason that I keep coming back and talking about all this stuff online and, and still being able to do this when a lot of other people are quitting for various reasons. I've seen a lot of that going on recently. And, you know, I've thought about that at times. I thought about, is it worth to, to, you know, is it worth it to keep doing this? And I've decided it is because of the community. And that's why in tonight's show, Every once in a while, we like to turn the camera back around a little bit and look at you, the audience, and find out what kind of questions you have, what kind of topics you want us to cover. Even if you don't think it would make like a good full episode of Devil's Advocates, what kind of small things might you have that have been on your mind or things you've heard about in comic books that you want to know what our thoughts are, if they're true, or what our take is. We'd love to hear about those tonight. So as you start thinking about that, I want you to get ready to type that into the chat because we're definitely going to want to hear about that. This is Devil's Advocates, and we'll catch you after the intro. What's up, the internet? How's it going? I am producer Kyle. That is Bronze Age Nerd since he's on the other side of me today. It's even got me more messed up. Uh, <laughs> tonight's show. When we put it together, we kind of said, hey, let's do another Mythbusters episode or a viewer mailbag thing. And we realized we don't have a ton of mail from y'all. And we don't have a ton of myths left to bust. So what At least I not one that you've thinking, talked about. <laughs> I'm sure there's so, plenty out there you guys can um, bring up. Yeah, right, right, right. At least ones that we've been told we need to address. Yeah. So I started thinking about some of the big myths I hear and some of the legends I hear. Like, there are things that are accepted as fact in the comic book business and in the comic book fandom that maybe aren't so much. Um, this is our episode where it's the equivalent to if you run through the rain, do you get more or less wet? So, uh, we want to hear from you. What are things that you have questions about things that you've been told things that you've experienced that you're like, ah, this feels weird to me. What do you guys think? Or how would you handle this? Uh, tell us, tell us these things in the comments and we will address them. Um, we have some stuff that we we plan to talk about, but more than anything, we want to talk about your stuff. Yeah. So, again, if we're talking about something you've heard or seen in a store, something we've heard or seen at a convention, something that you're like, hey, I, I'm thinking about doing this thing. How would you guys approach it? Um, you know, any kind of collecting questions, habits, hobbies, whatever. Um, throw them in the chat. We'll hit a, we'll put a star on them and we will come to them, uh, the first second we get, but the first topic and kind of the topic that I think is an easy way to set this up that we have pre-prepared. Wait, before you get started, uh, can I just say one thing? Mm. So I, I wanted to say hi real fast to some of the people in chat. We got Kenneth Preston, uh, we got Sean collector P the Nita, and I'm sure there's some others in, in like Instagram where I can't see the comments too, but Sean, you don't want to look at me on camera. I'm ugly is what you say. Dude, I'm up here. You're good. Don't worry about it. It's all fine, I met man. Sean. <laughs> and then uh, uh, Kenneth uh, says, I hope you continue what you do for the comic book family. Thank you so much for what you do. Thank you. I hope you keep it up. Good, awesome work you do. Uh, hey, we appreciate that. Thanks a lot, Kenneth. Thanks for coming here and continuing to watch. 
Uh, comic journey that is going to depend on your definition of live. Hold on. Oh no, I don't feel anything. I don't think I don't think we're live. This arm is. This arm is not. If it's the left one, I think it's, you're supposed to worry. I don't know. I have a pinched nerve here. Uh, oh, okay. So I can never find my pulse in this arm. And if I let him take my blood pressure at the doctor in this arm, it's always like 200 over 197. Like, like that's not right. You would be dead. I'm like, right. <laughs> you got to go to this arm. And that one's way low and you just balance them out. <laughs> you average it out. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yes. Uh, let me, let me oh, throw us some that. comments. Let's talk about things. We already have one from Sean. Uh, and, I'm going to go with, I'm going to throw our first comment, our first kind of topic at bronze, and we're going to circle Sean's into it. Cool. Because I think they play together. And the first thing, and I want you guys to answer in chat too, what is your current grail comic that you're hunting for that you think you can honestly get, right? That you think you can actually get. So like, if my grail is action comics, number one, I don't think I can honestly get one. So a, a, a grail you actually think you can get and what are your methodologies going to be for acquiring it? Yeah, it's a good one. So throw that in the comments. Let me know what you think. I'll tell you mine. If you told me yours, bronze, do you have one? Yeah, I have one. And it, it's kind of interesting because it's actually been forced to change a couple times. So um, when I got back into the comic collecting a few years ago, the, the number one grail for me was X-Men number one. And if you are able to recall, X-Men number one started to kind of go astronomical for a while uh, back right before, or sorry, right after, I guess I put it on my, my uh, grail. Like once I started learning about that concept, I was like, you know what? I have a grail. It's X-Men number one. That's, that's the one I'm hunting. And it went from literally the week that I was going to pull the trigger on a copy that was, I think I want to say it was like $1,300, maybe $1,500, signed by Stan Lee, 0. 0.5, uh, CGC yellow label. I was I was super interested in that, and I just basically missed out on it. And so I was hunting for the next copy that was anywhere close to that. And that's a pretty much the week that they started to spike and jump. And so that had to that had to stop being my grail because when it was when it, that particular copy when it when it went from going from like fifteen hundred to like ten thousand, I mean it was just out of the question for me. Uh, that's that's beyond my reach as a collector. So I had to set different goals. Now it's kind of it's not all the way back down, but it started to come back down, and it, it has kind of reappeared as the grail book that I'm hunting. And I'll, I'll get into the methodology later because I want to get get a chance to hear Kyle's. Yeah, uh, but that's kind of the what it's been for me now. So, Comic Journeys is Johnny the Homicidal Maniac first print in a nine nine. I hope the grade is the joke. Um, like, and I hope you're not at your grail is not actually hunting a nine nine. I hope your grail is finding a first print Johnny the Homicidal Maniac, because I imagine that first prints of that being out there on the market are hen's teeth already. Mm -hmm. but a nine nine is probably even more non-existent but that's a yeah. good one because like i said johnny the homicidal maniac is not a number one first prints are not things you find regular no and then to yeah like so to find one in that high a grade is even like a further reach for me i'm kind of in the same boat as comic journey like, I hate to be this guy, Bronze, but the book you want is so much more common than the book I want. Like, yep. um, so I'm looking for an Emerald or a San Diego Comics Presents number three. Mm -hmm. It is the only pre Hellboy Hellboy I don't have. Yeah, I mean, that's like the Hellboy Grail, right? For most it people, is... I imagine. I right. See, this is what I'm saying, Comics Journey. Like nine nines are non existent. You'll settle for a nine eight. Like, I think you can probably find a nine eight. I, I mean, I imagine it's gonna be hard, but I think it's possible. 
right? And it's like mine. I know when I find mine, I'm not going to be able to find it in a high grade. It's just, I don't think they exist that way. And the people who have them that way are not going to part with them. Although here's what you do. You pick yourself up a 9.8, you crack it, and you do a 9.9 pre-screen. I think that's <laughs> I think that's your method these days. I have a finger that the nine nine pre screen people should look at. <laughs> um, I can't read between the lines. I don't get it. <laughs> all right, Preston says I already picked up a copy of Nick's number three, so I'm not sure what my grail is. Maybe Vampirel number one with the Frazetta cover. That's a good one. I like that, but Preston, I think maybe like something for you to look up. That first appearance, the Harris appearance. I think it's the first Harris appearance. I saw one the other day for like 2700 And I almost bought it just to try and turn it to Nick for profit. But I didn't because I thought that'd be mean. <laughs> I'm but, surprised you didn't have that one already. What, a vampy? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not certain he doesn't. I'm just saying. You know, hey, man, yeah. I bought this. You know, you give me four for it. You know, something like that. Um, well, and I actually, so real fast, though, because you brought up something I want to address, the the rarity in the grail. And that's the funny thing about the term grail for me is a loaded one um, to a large extent. My favorite thing is people that have like 50 grails. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's not, I mean, hey, that's the way you want to collect. That's totally cool. I'm actually not harshing your mellow on that one. I just think it's weird. Like, I can't get behind that personally. I do admit that I have a trifecta of grails because I'm an X-Men fan. And it's because I, I can't I can't really say that any of them I would be ecstatic to have over the others. Because it's, I mean, technically it's X-Men 1, Hulk 181, because I already have a Hulk 180, and giant size X-Men number 1. And it's really just because of the combination of first appearances there for characters that I love. Um, and again, second appearance, if you want to say it for 181, whatever, that's fine. Um, but it, it's just that thing where it's like, they're not rare. Each of those comics, like especially giant size X-Men and Hulk 181, they're not rare by any stretch of the imagination. And X-Men one isn't even rare, but it's, it's about love for me. It's about, it's like, what do I love? What do I right. want to own the most? Because I'm a fan. The funny thing is, is when people have the list of like 50 comics, it's just like, that's by the way, I recommend everybody kind of do that. If you really want to like go out there and collect comics, actually write down a list. A lot of people don't do this, and you might be surprised. I'm not saying it needs to be 50. Maybe it's 10. Right. Maybe it's 100. I don't. doesn't matter. But write it out sometime and see what you really think. If you really want to play around with it after that, order that list and figure out what's more important than the next one down below or whatever. I think that's fun to do. The ordering is what matters. And I believe it or not, Comics Journey, this was my grail 2019. Beginning of 2019, I wanted an, an Evil Ernie number one. I bought it in 2019, and that's when the the San Diego popped up, uh, cropped up. But what I do with my Grail list, because I'm a multiple Grail guy, um, I have at any given point I have between five and seven. Okay, it's a manageable list. Um, yeah. right, and but they're price they're they're gauged by price point. Yeah. So my big bold faced grail is, is San Diego Comics, right? That's one that I know is going to require a not sig not insignificant financial outlay, right? Like that's one that's going to cost me. Yeah. Um. But I have other grails that I'm looking for that I think are more based on price, right? So if I'm looking to spend less than a hundred bucks right now, my grail on that, believe it or not. Is uh, the Batman number one, New 52. Okay. I sold my last, I, I have all, I have two through the end of the New 52. I sold my number one a year ago to pay a bill because I knew somebody who wanted one and I knew, you know, so, and now I need to replace it. Yeah. Right. I have a less than $500 one. I have a, you know, a less than $200, like that kind of stuff. And so that's, that's how I sort my grails, right? Is by what am I willing to spend for this thing? And if that if that book is priced beyond that limit for me, then I don't even look for it, right? Mm -hmm. um, 
the silver foil or the silver silver poly bag death of superman i think it's worth about 50 bucks i'm willing to pay about 50 bucks for it you can't get it for 50 bucks it just doesn't exist for 50 bucks so i don't even really look for it now someday i'll find it and it'll be 75 and i'll just pull the trigger but that's how i sort mine so we want to talk methodology about how you achieve, how you get your grails a little bit yeah. here um, and so you guys who are talking about the ones you've got, uh, or the ones you're hunting, Incredible Hulk one. Um, Sean's looking for a first printing. Something is killing the children, bro. I wish I'd have known. I just I had a dozen of them two years ago. Um, comic journey. I'm kind of the same way, man. Like I'm, like I need a bone number one, but only if it's signed by Jeff Smith. Like very obscure kind of weird stuff so i'm with you there um right on but collector p man has said the thing um so we're gonna get around to that um yep but it's uh collector p nice i wouldn't mind that or a flash 123 either flash 123 uh <laughs> uh sean uh, i think you-, you take up house robbing um, I bet you Kyle has my entire list at his house, minus like probably like five books he's never heard of because he doesn't care about them. <laughs> I don't have your X Men's. I'll tell you that much. Oh, okay, there you go. I don't have a very. I have a very impressive X Men eighty through three, like eighty through ninety three, ninety four, mm-hmm. and then like nothing. Until X Men Gold. So, well, hey, buddy, man, you've been chasing Akira one for. I remember looking at uh, Conan with you looking for an Akira number one not that long ago or uh, last year, I guess. So uh, you've been chasing that for a while, man. Well, like I'm hunting a Domokun number one for Sasagi Ajimbo. I have one. It's not a Grail because I have one, but I need. I want a nicer copy. Anyway, so how do you how do you hunt for the grails you're looking for? And the myth that I hear often is that grails are hard to find. Which is true, that's what makes them grails. But if you come up with a very specific plan for hunting them, they suddenly become easier. And this is the first this is the first kind of myth I want to bust. I like to make a top 10 list to look for at cons and different comic shops. And Sean had asked, well, I'm going to my first comic con in May. What's a myth I can be busted about going to one? The myth I want to kind of address here is that things at conventions are more expensive than things that are not at conventions. You're paying a premium for the convention. And so I wanted to approach this kind of in that way of, do you think that's true? Have you had experiences that support that theory and some experiences that di- uh, that counterman that theory? So now, I know you're asking for the audience. Do you want me to chime in on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so for me, I think it, it's really dependent. Um, I, I am not a seasoned con goer. I live in an area where, unless I want to fly, I don't really get a ton of access to big cons, but I've, I've started going to the ones that I can get to more often, right? That's been my thing the last few years. In my experience, I'll tell you that I've never walked up to a booth and I've never paid what they're asking for a book. I just doesn't happen. I mean, the exception might be if I'm going through like they have a, a dollar bin or a really cheapo bin and I load up on a bunch of books and I'm also buying a couple big books that I kind of don't really count those. So I guess that's a technically an exception. But the idea that, you know, I, I see it from both sides because I know I look at a lot of books at cons and I go, that's overpriced for what I consider the FMV to be. But the FMV is subjective and that's the big point. What a seller is, and, and I know this can kind of turn into a little bit of a heated topic, um, but what the seller is willing to sell it for and what the seller has it listed at are often two different things. And I will ask, hey, 
I'm interested in this book. You know, I'll look at it. I don't, this might sound like I do this. I don't look at the book assuming I'm going to ask for a lower price, but nine times out of 10, more than that, probably even I look at the book and I go, honestly, I think it's worth this much. I'll ask if they want to sell it for that much. If they don't, I don't give them a hard time. I move on. I maybe circle back later if I really want to. Um, so I think that it really depends on your mindset going in. If you're comfortable asking politely, and that to me is a, it, I'm not like overly polite. I'm not like, oh, please, please, Maggie. You know, like, but I, I'm not rude about it, right? Like that's the right. big thing. I'm just like, right. hey, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking more like this, or uh, would you be willing to move on this? And I let them kind of start the price negotiation on it. And if they're not, cool, man. There's a bunch of other vendors I want to go see and talk to. I do want these for this price. Let's talk about these or something like that. Right. So I think that it really depends on the mindset is what I'd say. CJ is on fire tonight, Um, which is to say it's a different type of buying strategy at a convention. And I would argue that grail hunting and grail buying is a different type of buying strategy than everyday buying. If you're going in and buying run filler, that's a different thing than buying a grail. And so the first thing I would tell you, and this is Alberto or Preston, I'm sorry, Preston. um, My first rule is never buy, never buy the moment you find something. I'm going to disagree with your rule and then I'm going to agree with it. The thing I'm going to disagree with is the time to buy something cool is when you see it. Because if you walk away, there's a chance you'll never see it again. Yep. However, You have to always, when you're grail hunting especially, always be willing to take the L and walk away. Mm -hmm. Um, The the best example I can give, and this is something that I do a lot at conventions, is if I go to a three-day show, a Friday, Saturday, Sunday show, I buy on Friday and I buy on Sunday. I buy nothing on Saturday. Yeah. If I'm going to a four-day show, I buy on Thursday and I buy on Sunday. I never buy anything in the middle of a convention. Good strategy. And here's what here's what that has taught me. On Friday, you have a lot of people who are looking to get into the red or getting get into the black, right? Convention dealers and sellers are having to upfront all of the money to get there, to buy the space, to do all this stuff before the show starts. So they're already behind. If you can help them get to the black a little faster, they're usually willing to work with you. And if you can do that on the first day of the show so that they feel like the whole weekend is going to be profitable for them, they're really open. Friday, Saturday, or the middle days of a convention are the busiest days. You know, especially a four day convention yeah. because people don't take the Thursday off, but they'll take the Friday and they'll take the Friday off. So Friday, Saturday, usually the busiest days. Those are the days that dealers know they can stand pat because the second you walk away, there's another person coming to look, especially at big shows at small shows. It's a little different, but at big shows, it's true. Then on Sunday, they don't want to take everything home. And then on also on Sunday is when the desperation sets in. I've made my money, but I haven't made my number. Yeah. Or I haven't made my money because I had unexpected costs. Dinner was more expensive, whatever. So they're usually willing to wheel and deal. Or they've already made enough money that it's just icing on the cake to them at that point. If they've had a good con, they might be like, right. yeah, you know, it doesn't right. really they've matter already, if I yeah, it's break all even problem. on this book. Then it turns into, I don't really want to load this thing up anymore. I've made my money. I'm good. I Do I really want to haul this thing home? Um, and the strategy that really has worked well for me is bundling. Mm-hmm. So on Friday or on the first day of a show, I go to a dealer and I see two or three things that I want. And I, you know, then it's that, then you start the negotiation with the, uh, Hey, I see you have 2,500 on that book. I think it's worth about two grand, but I'm not going to bother you with that. I also want this, these other two books. 
If I give you 2500 on this book, what will you do on the other two? Or if I give you 500 on this book, what will you do on the other two? Right? And so all of a sudden it's, well, I've got, you know, a thousand into this book I'm selling for 2000 and you're willing to give me 2000 I've got 500 into these other books that I'm asking 500 for. I'll cut a little slice off of those and we all, I still make my margins. You know, you can, you can play these games. The other thing that's really important in con buying and a grail hunting is knowing your grades. Yeah. You can, a lot of times at conventions haggle a lot more on grades on raw books than you can in a stuff in a store and on keys even more. Um, and then, yeah, so here's the problem. Here's the problem with this. And I like this strategy. The last two hours of the last day of con is by that point, you either have dealers who are pissed that they didn't make their money. They're checked out because they have made their money or they're already working on getting ready to go home. Yeah. So if you wait that long, you might wind up getting a bad deal because you've now waited till an inopportune time. Well, and this actually, there's one thing I want to say about that too, because I agree with what you said, but there's another reason why Friday works or, or Thursday, if it's a four day con, because part of it, you're right. That part of it is they want to, they want to start making those sales. They want to get the momentum rolling. But another part of it is they have more time to work with. Like if, if there's 50 other people lining up around their booth and you're trying to like, nickel and dime or whatever is what they might think of it as at the moment. Mm -hmm. They're thinking like, I'm losing money on these other people that I need to pay attention to, or that might, you know, I see that guy eyeing that book that costs three times what we're talking about right now. All those things can be going through their head on Friday or Thursday. If it's slow, I'm not saying you take up a bunch of their time or anything like that. Don't, don't hear me wrong. I'm just saying, you know, they might have a couple extra minutes to have a conversation about the grade or kind of go over that. They'll probably take that time with you anyway, but they're going to be more of in a hurry on that busy Saturday or early Sunday, or if they're trying to tear down or whatever. Right. So on the last day of the con, I try and do all of my big deals before say noon. If the con opens at 10, I try and do it all in the first two hours of the day. Because after that dealers, especially, especially guys with big booths are starting to strategize getting out. Um, so I try to do it all early unless, and this is the caveat to this comment, right? I'm buying in bulk. Yeah. If I'm going up to somebody and saying, Hey, I'll give you 500 bucks for all of your long boxes. Doing it in the last two hours a day is a good time to do it. Doing it right at the end is a good time to do it because now it's, Hey, I can save you from having to break your back loading this out. Yeah. Yeah but I'm not going to take money off the table because you can keep selling. So it's, you know, it's that kind of idea, right? Of depending on what you're trying to buy. But if you're grail hunting, you want to do it before people are in the change their mentality mode. The other thing I would say convention buying strategy is different. And you tell me what you think of this bronze is it helps to get in the mindset of the seller. Mm hmm. And you'll hear you've you guys have heard this a lot from me on this show, right? As a retailer, as a seller, I'm always trying to keep the seller in mind when I'm approaching this stuff. Because if I if I can take a guess at what the seller has into the book, because I know approximately what the grade is, I know approximately what the value of that grade is. I can take a guess at what the seller has paid for the book. I go in with a lot more chips on my shoulder and I'm on the table than the seller does when trying to negotiate back for me because they have no idea how much money I have in my pocket. So you find a guy selling a book that you think is worth 50 bucks for 75. That means they're probably into it 40 bucks, 45 bucks. 35 bucks, somewhere in that range. So if you make them an offer, you know, you think it's worth 50, they got it for 75. 
you make them an offer somewhere in the 60s, they're still making a pretty good chunk. You're getting a deal, probably getting it closer to your range, and everybody wins. Yeah. It's this idea of rem- kind of thinking like a seller while buying always helps. Well, what I'd add to that is, so I'm a big believer in general of the the uh, Carnegie principle, you know, the how to win friends and influence people, right? A big part of the, the philosophy of that, if you're not familiar with the book, a big part of the, the principle of that is to me, it's almost like a second golden rule, right? The golden rule, you do unto others what you want them to do unto you, right? For me, the second rule is to be thinking about what other people want. Because this is this is the idea of you're the main character of your own story, right? I think it's important because people have a lot of ego, especially today. I feel like that's worse than ever. Try to break yourself out of being the main character in your own story. Don't think of the person you're you're buying from as a shopkeeper in a video game, in other words. Uh, think of them as a human being that's there trying to do, accomplish a goal. And, uh, you know, Kyle just gave a really nuanced uh answer this but that just as a general mindset anytime you're negotiating a deal or talking to a business partner or talking to in my opinion another human being think about what their motive is here and don't just be basic like obviously they're there to make money obviously they're there to sell stuff but depends on what the book is it depends on what you know what you've picked out um if you see like like an example might be if you're looking for uh pre-code horror and they obviously don't specialize in that. All their stuff's modern. Well, that one pre-code horror book they have is probably an outlier for them. Maybe it's something that, you know, it just doesn't, they don't have a place to put it and you're kind of growing aggressively after that. Well, you know, think about it from that perspective. Maybe pick up some of their modern stuff and then, and then you know, or if you're going to negotiate on that modern, on that uh, pre-code horror book, tell me, oh, don't worry, I'll take care of some of the modern too, but I'll, I'll get this one off your hands if we can come to a deal on it. Approach it from those kinds of perspectives. That's just like one one off the top example. Yeah. Um, I think um, that's really important. CJ, you're conflating what I said with what I actually said. What you think I said with what I actually said. A dealer is definitely into a book that they're selling for seventy five for at least forty dollars. Period. I didn't say they paid that. You have to remember that once you buy a book, you're still putting money into it after you've bought it. You're putting it in a bagging board. You're processing. You're grading. You're all that man hours cost time hauling it to the convention, putting it in your booth, the floor space at your booth, floor space at your store. It all starts to add up to the point where the margins are actually a lot thinner than you think, right? Especially if that dealer paid was dishonest when they bought the book and ripped somebody off. But if you're offering fifty percent of what you think the full retail value is on the seventy-five dollar book. You're offering, what are we talking, thirty-seven fifty? So that's only another two dollars and fifty cents for your time, your energy, your freight, all of that kind of stuff to get to forty dollars. Yeah, maybe I'm reading it. Right. I think he's saying that they would have paid a lot less. Uh, I'm not right or wrong. I'm saying I think that's what he's saying. Right, I'm saying, but that's what I'm saying. Even if they paid fifty percent of market value. That's only leaving them two dollars and fifty cents. So if they're paying thirty percent of market value, that leaves them a little more room. But the margins certainly shrink the longer the book is held by a seller, because trying to sell the book costs money. It just does. So that's what I'm talking about when I start thinking about the retailer, right? So if I go to a convention in Chicago and I see a retailer from LA. I know they're a lot deeper into getting there with their product than the guy from Indianapolis. Period. And Comic Journey, you say there's no way. I paid it all the time. All the time. When I had my store. And I still do when I buy collections. But I usually pay 50% on books I know I can move in under a week or under two weeks. Because it keeps that margin bigger. Just something to think about. Knowing what a book is worth, you can kind of estimate things a lot easier. So we're going to take our first break. We need to take our break. Uh, We're only going to take the one tonight, Jay. Um, And we're going to come back and we're going to dive more into this topic that Sean threw out there. And anything else you guys get to, 
uh, myths about Comic Cons. So we will be right back in just a few minutes. Did you know that every experience show, including some exclusive content, streams on Twitch? Check it out. Twitch.tv forward slash the underscore EXP. Or just scan that QR code. Welcome back in, everybody. This is Devil's Advocates. I am producer Kyle. That's Bronze Age Nerd. And we are doing a little bit of comic book myths and legends talk tonight. Uh, talking about myths and stuff we, uh, we're we trying to bust. And Sean came up with a great one. Sean threw something at us that I think is a great topic, which is myths about Comic-Cons. Um, before we dive back into that stuff, comic journey, when you're ready, you call me, but I know you're a smoker, so you're going to get less of an offer. <laughs> Maybe sell to somebody who hasn't had you on the stream. By the way, th there's a myth confirmed. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> as far as, uh, I, I, this is not, I'm not directly talking to CJ. There's, there's one other. And I'm just busting his chops. I know his books no, are going to be no, gorgeous. No. So. This is a funny thing that I, I hear. And I know it's this is true of a lot of things with smokers. I've had a smoker tell me like, "Um, oh, none of my books smell like cigarette smoke." And then they sent me something. I'm not gonna say who it is. Don't worry. And it, it's definitely not Comic Journey. Uh, they sent me something, and it, <laughs> man, and I, I had parents that both smoked a pack a day growing up. Uh, luckily, they quit. So I'm used to cigarette smoke, and I'm used to like strong cigarette smoke. This was like the strongest cigarette smell I've ever smelled. <laughs> And I was just like, sure, your stuff doesn't smell. And I told him, and I, you know, man, that, that there's a myth confirmed. <laughs> yeah, no, like, but I'm, I know smokers whose stuff is immaculate. So I'm just yeah. giving CJ a hard time because I know two things. He doesn't put his face on camera and he had a cigarette in his hand while we were on stream. Those are the two things I know. <laughs> so <laughs> you're good, man. When you're ready, though, and I may, I know, I know kind of what part of the country you're in. I may be reaching out because I'm coming that way to buy a big collection. So maybe we do some business. But we'll work that out later. Um, so convention myths. I'm going to list. I'm going to put one out there that I don't think Sean is going to have to deal with, but it's always important. If you're standing in the pizza line at a convention, make sure Ray Mysterio is not the person behind you before you buy the last slice of pepperoni. Solid. <laughs> I love that story. Yeah, great. It's great, great story, but really upsetting to me as a wrestling fan. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, so what are some common myths? Uh, oh, you just have to worry about John Cena. That's even worse because you won't be able to see him if you turn around. Um, I wish I understood some... that joke. I hear it so often. Oh, bronze. I'm only familiar with John Cena as an actor. Uh, and I, by the way, I enjoy John Cena, the actor, for the most part. And I've seen that in Fortnite. I know that's a thing. I don't understand. That's, it, you though. can't see me. But that why? Was John why? Cena's like signature. Why? Okay. Because then he'd punch you in the face. <laughs> I, I may. I need. I need to. Is there like a clip I could go watch? It's like the origin of that. Like the. Like the yeah, first probably. time you did it. Or I'll work it out. Okay. I'll send it to All you later. Right. We got to move on from this. Um, no, I, lo I love it. I love learning about pop culture. Um, so here's a myth from a convention. Mm hmm. And this is maybe a little bit more of an, uh, uh, and warm and fuzzy one. Oh, good. I'll tell you this myths from conventions, but let's, let's give everybody, uh, 
let's give Sean good tips for his first. He's not going to a small convention. He's going to a pretty pretty big convention that I'll be honest. I was talking to uh to Jenna about last night. A convention that's a little big for its britches. Hmm. Okay. Well, this is, I think this will be a perfect good uh, good one for for uh, Sean. Then here's the myth: the comics are the reason to go to a comic con. And here's why I think that's a myth. Some of the best memories I have from comic cons are about people I've met there, interactions I've had, um, seeing people that I've you know read their work for years hearing some of the anecdotes that they're telling um, funny things that happen in line, cool cosplay. You see uh, weird off the wall products you didn't know existed. Um, I, I could go on. There's a lot of things like that. The things that I don't really think about when I think about going to comic cons are the comics I got there. There's some exceptions to that. I don't want to say that like, you know, it's of course I do remember some of those things. Uh, I love comic books, of course, but it, it, there's cons I go to now, like uh, Kyle was saying, don't, he doesn't buy it on Saturdays. If I go to a con for a couple days, like if I go Friday, Saturday, or if I go Saturday, Sunday, that off day that isn't Saturday is the day that I'm buying and looking around browsing. The Saturday is the day that I'm meeting up with people and talking to them or, or waiting in lines. Uh, which sounds weird. If I can get through quickly on a Friday or a Sunday or whatever, I'll totally do that. But talking to those creators sometimes it's a much different vibe talking to a creator who has no line on a Friday. And sometimes that's what I want. Some of them, it's a almost like you get, they're being on a little bit more on Saturdays, uh, especially the big names. Um, I'll tell you, Adam Hughes, for example, is somebody who was, had a very different vibe on the Saturday than he did on the Sunday. Uh, a couple others too, you know, and I, that's not a bad thing. They know they're going to be busy on that Saturday. So they're kind of prepared for it. Um, and not every creator is super social or super, uh, able to, to rise to that occasion, right? Like the, in the, in the way that you might expect in the kind of don't meet your heroes kind of way. So be prepared for that too. If you are going there to meet a couple creators, just, you know, kind of roll with whatever comes your way when, when you're talking to them and make sure you get what you want out of that experience. If you really want a selfie, if you really want to just tell them how much you like their work do that and do it for you because right. how they react to that might be completely different from one creator to the next. And Absolutely. sometimes it's not the way you want it to go. And sometimes it's everything you could hope for and better than you expected. So the busiest days of the con are the days that I say, and this is true across the board for anyone working the convention are the rehearsed line days, <laughs> right? Those are the days where they're just, repeating the same lines over and over and over and over and over again. So they're, even if they're your friend, they're going to mimic those lines to you because it's what they're doing that day. Other days are a little more friendly. There's another term I want to give you, Sean, because you talk about meeting Dan Price. Don't be a booth barnacle. Hmm. And you know these people, if you've done enough conventions, you've done any conventions, they're the people who come up to the table and stand and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And they're blocking the table and no one else can buy because you're standing in front of the table talking. You're less barnacly at the beginning of a show when there's less people there or at the end of a show when there's less people there than you are during the height of the show. So one of my one of my things that I do, depending on where the show is, I don't even go on Saturday. I'll buy a three day pass. And I'll go Friday and I might go first thing Saturday morning if I can get there early enough to be one of the first people in the door, go do some real quick business with a creator or a celebrity or whoever I'm there to see. And then I leave the building. And I've got a badge, so I can get back in and out. So I tell my friends, the ones who know me, you need a pizza, you need food, just call me and I'll bring it to you. You know, we'll work that out. I'm the outside guy. I'm the fixer at that point. And like in Chicago, when I go to shows, I use Saturday and I go to like the Field Museum. And I do the touristy stuff. And I, 
then I go back on Sunday and do business. And the reason I do that is it gets me out of other people's hair. They don't have to worry about whether or not I'm there to talk to them or buy something. I don't have to deal with all of the, pardon my French, the people who don't need to be there. You know, the people who are, oh my God, I didn't know comic books still existed. (laughs) You know, they're there because they have a friend who drug them along or they have a kid who's interested. And I'm glad they're there. I want them to be engaged. But like, get out of the way. You know, Dude, the um, last time I went to, there was a guy, I won't say the artist. I won't, I, I won't say the, the, you know, I don't know the guy's name, but he goes up to this, this creator and I'm, I'm waiting very patiently. Uh, I, I have a professional reason I'm going to be engaging with this person. I'm going to be asking about a charity event I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And so I'm waiting and, and there's only one person in line. So I'm like, this is going to be easy. This person asks let's just, I'll say this person is known for creating comics in the horror genre. And he asks him, but I wouldn't say like, you know, <laughs> not Hellraiser and Freddy and Jason. And all. He's asking him about every single horror movie and what he thinks. But more importantly, he's doing it to tell him what he thinks about each of these properties. And in my head, I'm literally counting down like, all right, man, how many more properties can this guy go through? Let's see. He hasn't talked about Halloween yet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he's the, the last part. person I need to talk to. And I'm just like doing everything I can to like, you know, can we, can we start to, can, this guy is not helping you out. I right. want to, I want to do business with you. <laughs> you want to know, you want to know a trick that I picked up probably my second C2E2 and I've used millions of times since then. And creators really appreciate it. It's kind of a dick move. But you just kind of put your hand on that person's back and say, excuse me, I I have a panel I need to get to. I, I Real quick, I just want to hand this, you know, creator this flyer about this charity event. I'm doing. I'd love to talk to you more about it, you know, doing this charity event. Um, but I've got a panel to get to. Can I just... And usually that person will walk away. Yeah. And then you can actually have your conversation. Yeah. And I almost, I, I actually almost did that with this person um, in this particular, and that's good advice. Um, but I also try to like, you know, I didn't know like, okay, maybe there, I, there was some stuff sitting on the tables. Like maybe this guy's going to buy a bunch of stuff from this guy. And the last thing I want to do is be the jerk that like right. prevents him from buying more stuff from the artist or whatever. Um, Cause like, again, I was going to ask for something and buy some stuff. So I didn't want to be, I didn't want to like step on any toes. Right. And it's always, that's, that's probably the biggest tip I can give to somebody going to a con. Just really try to like focus before you go into the show, clear your mind and try to be, you know, I think uh, Max Sin City Collectibles said it earlier. Try to, you know, if you're, if you're a guy or whatever, try to be a gentleman, try to think about what it's like to, to be kind uh, and assertive if you need to be, but not aggressive and don't be a jerk. You know, I, I think that's a big thing. And also don't let yourself get like just overwhelmed by the whole thing. Just take it in and enjoy it. I think that you really, you're kind of your, your personality you walk in with is going to influence how your show goes. Yeah. Um, so the other thing I will do to those people is I will step up to the table beside them and start selling stuff off the table to them. <laughs> Especially if it's a creator, I know a little bit or I'm real familiar with their product. Hey, did you know about this? This is and this is and I start doing the whole sales sales spiel, and the creator can take a drink of water, and usually I'm a little more pushy than a creator can be because I my money, and if the guy buys the stuff, fantastic. Yeah. If he walks away, I make sure I buy stuff. <laughs> so it's it's this idea of playing this game. Um. JD, the answer was it wasn't a Rush album. It was Snakes and Arrows, the graphic novel written by Rush drummer Neil Peart. And it's the hardcover slipcase edition signed by Neil Peart, Kevin J. Anderson, and everyone else who worked on it. And this was the first bad experience I had with Kevin J. Anderson that led me to then have my incredible stance of I hate Kevin J. Anderson. Man, I've heard that from a lot of people. So, um, Hey, by the way, about, about this one, the lines are for suckers. And I, I, I love you, CJ. I know, I know your personality and everything. Um, but, but for real, there's a real, other than just a joke, which he's also being a hundred percent serious for himself. There's a real tip in there. 
my rule, for example, is about three people. The, I will get in a line for about three people, no problem. For if what? To, for a signing or a, for, for a signing. So, so signing. are we talking a celebrity or a creator? Creator. Okay. And and here's what I mean by that, just to, to add one level of detail to that. It doesn't mean that like if I walk by that booth five times and there's always 10 people online, I'll never go to them. It just means that like I'm willing to stay Teflon and kind of keep moving and come back. And unless I see the line only growing ever, you know, if, if, if I if I if I go back four times and it, ooh, it's 10 people and then it's 20 people and then it's 30 people, that doesn't happen very often. If it does, OK, I better get in line if I want to see this person today because I'm going to be waiting in line all day. But really what it means is I just keep going around and every time there's there's like two exceptions I can think of. I've come back and there's been a shorter line than, than and, I, and I've had a chance to go up to somebody who didn't have a line. Right. Usually conventions are laid out in a way that like, especially if you're an artist alley, there's usually one row or one section where there might be cool creators, but people just for, for whatever reason, because of the flow of traffic, they're not getting over there. If you can find that area, hit those creators when you're trying to wait for another line to die down, wait in line by walking around. Right. They, I call them puddles. Um, a great example was one year I was at, again, it was C2E2. And at one end of the row was Greg Capullo and the other end of the row was Katie Cook. This is peak Katie Cook and peak Greg Capullo, right? Not that either, either of them have really come down, but you know what I mean? Like there were bronies everywhere and guys in Batman suits everywhere. And what happens is those lines create a puddle in the middle where all these other creators are getting the rub from that. Um, and so, like, when I wanted to meet Capullo, I had to avoid the puddle and find out where his line actually was and kind of clock it. So just be prepared for that kind of stuff. I will say this, Comic Journey, getting them to call you over even if there's a line is a good trick, but it's not for most people. Yeah. Like it's so, like some of the myths here, like uh, carve yourself about six hours for a Claremont signature. Don't carve yourself about six hours for a Claremont signature. Like the reality of it is, is that unless you desperately want to meet Chris Claremont and talk to Chris Claremont and he's not going to be very talkative generally because he's going to be signing six hours worth of signatures. It's going to be I, a very brief conversation. You're not going to get to like exchange life stories. That is the opposite. I've heard he'll answer any question you have for as long as you want. He I've will, but you like, you're not going to get to know Chris Claremont. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. You can set your book down and ask him a question and he'll talk to you while he's signing and maybe even talk to you for a few seconds after. But you know, it's not like you're going to get, you're sitting down to eat dinner with Chris Claremont. So, like, don't. But there are other options there. Liefeld, if you if you have a debt, uh, New Mutants 98. That's not necessarily true. Again, there are ways around some of this stuff. Some of the myths that I'm seeing from you, Comic Journey, are ones that I absolutely identify with. Especially this one. <laughs> um, but then I reminded him that his teeth aren't real. And he shut up real fast. Um it's also really short if he gives you a hard time. And I mean, unless I mean, you're, I'm, I'm sorry, unless you're short too. Well, I mean, my, my experience with, with Starenko calling me fat was, uh, really, do you want me to pick you up and put me on, put you on my shoulder so you can show everyone your fake teeth? <laughs> That's a good one. Oh, like, man. And that only comes with having known him via email and social media for a long time. I, I will say my version of this, by the way, if, if so, if, if part of this is that, you know, a creator, I don't know, maybe it's just me or whatever, but like I've, I've hung around booths for people that they know me and they look over and they see me and we kind of just make that eye contact. Like, yeah, I know. Like, yeah. And then, then they'll, it, it's funny. They'll brush off that person and be like, Hey, I, you know, I'm glad to see you. There's a couple guys I run into at, at several cons I've been to that will do that with me. Um, and it, it's almost kind of like that <laughs> you're saving them from a booth barnacle kind of way, you know, like I, I've kind of noticed that and they remember that. Right. So that's the kind yeah, of stuff. Creators you know. remember you helping them. 
They always remember. Yeah. Um, Comic Journey, the answer is he does. But at this point, when I run into him, he calls me the blob and I call him Plastic Man. So it's, you know, pet names. Um, the other the other one I would give you with um, the lines thing, right? If you, there's someone you desperately want to meet and you want to be you want to talk to them. The easiest thing you can do at easiest thing you can do party a little less the night before mm -hmm. be first in the door. Period. Um, a great example is Walking Dead was at its pop biggest popularity. And I had a Walking Dead number one that needed a Tony Moore sketch and remark. Well, that was a three hour line all weekend, no matter when you went. So what did I do on Saturday morning? I got up at 4 a.m. for a show that didn't open till 10 and went and sat and waited. So I was first in the door. And I went right to Tony Moore's booth, so I was first in line. And when he rolled in about 10, 15, I got my sketch and my signature. There you go. Now, that's the same as waiting, but it's not. Because I still had, I then had the rest of the show all day to do my business. Yeah, and there's a couple other things I want to, like, these are related to that, only it's the idea of... If you, especially if it's the first con you're going to, and that, this is why I'm, I'm directing this a lot at Sean. Mm -hmm. it, let's say there's like two people there that you are desperate to meet. Like you want to meet a, a creator A and creator B, and they're really popular. Um, do yourself a favor and look around for other shows they may be going to, because there's a huge difference between waiting in line to talk to somebody at, you know, I, I've never been, so I, I just know what the atmosphere is like. New York City Comic Con versus talking to them at a regional con. And if you're willing to forego talking to that person right there, right then, because you know in two months or a month they're going to be at a smaller show where you might be able to uh, not wait behind 150 people and only wait behind 75, that might be a good tip. And here's the other one. like This is specifically related to Chris Claremont. I'm aware of the line reputation for Chris, Chris Claremont, but I'm a huge X-Men fan, and I'm a huge Claremont writing X-Men fan. So one of the things I did was I sent all my X-Men books that I wanted signed into CGC for one of those in-house signing events. I'm not saying yep. you should do that if you don't want to, but I'm saying if you if you want the signature and you're willing to wait to have that moment with that creator at another time, maybe have all the books signed then and then bring like one book in and just really watch the line or something like that or get in really early and try to ask those questions more than get a bunch of books signed at the show. If that's what you prefer, I found that pretty helpful. Um, I tend to prefer the story and the inner in the interaction of meeting somebody, but I also like I know I'll do that at some point. I'll know I'll say some words to Chris Claremont and talk to him and have some words with him about his feelings on Cyclops. And uh, when I do that, I won't have to be worrying about pulling out twenty X Men books I want him to sign or something like that. All right, so um, we're in the last minute of the show here. So what we're gonna do is. Uh, rapid fire tips for new convention goers. And here's what we're going to do. Uh, I'm going to give the first one, then bronze, you give one and then we'll go back and forth. Sound good. Yeah. Um, first one is eat at off times. Don't go at normal lunch times. Don't go at other kinds. It's, you know, when other people are eating, eat at off times, lines will be shorter. The food will be hotter. Yeah. For me, the tip is bring oh. cash. Right, cool. Um, the next tip that I'm going to give uh, to everyone is uh, for first time convention goers is if you don't want to bring cash, preloaded Visa gift cards. Yeah, there you go. Preloaded gift cards are a great way, especially because more and more. Um, more and more conventions are cash free these days for things that aren't buying from artists and creators. So preloaded visa gift cards, they they're less likely to get stolen. They're, you know, you have your credit card number compromised they are less likely to do all that kind of stuff. So those are two, two big answers there. Um, I like comic journeys. Don't lean all of your stuff 
on people's booths. Yeah, don't pile your stuff on people's tables unless they let you. Faith. Um, along with the cash, so the reason the, the reason I say cash, by the way, is very specific. There, there's the obvious reason that a lot of people say was like, you know, cash talks, right? Like, and people can understand cash and here's, I'm paying in cash. You don't have transaction fees to deal with, et cetera. It's quicker. Uh, they don't have to sit there and pull up their square app or whatever. But there's another reason that I actually say that. And that is because it, if you have problems budgeting or what you're going to spend on a comic, on a, at a comic con, or you might be overwhelmed by like, that feeling of like, well, at this booth, I spent this much. Well, I still have to see this booth and I spent this much and now I have to see this booth and I spent this much. Having a preloaded card or having that cash, have, it gives you a physical limit to what's available for you to spend. So mm -hmm. if you know your budget is $500 or whatever, then that's your budget. And it's right. easier to stick to it when you have a hard limit like that. Right. Don't, don't count on people having bags for you to carry your stuff and bring your own bag. <laughs> Have have you seen CJ talk about that? Is that why you're the comic? No, oh my god! But I got, I'm I I'm one year I did a convention where I didn't sell any comics, but I brought four different size tote bags and sold tote bags all weekend to people who needed bags because they didn't think to bring bags. Um, and with that, uh, don't buy one of the don't buy one of the cups for unlimited refills at the convention. Every convention oh. center has those machines now. Where you can put your bottle in and refill your water bottle, bring a water bottle. Yeah, that, that's my rule. A lot of times those soda guys are—it's so stupid the price you're paying for the soda you're getting. Bring a water bottle that you can refill. Um, here's my quick tip: bring. Um, so if it, it depends on what you like, but if you like, uh, like eleven by seventeen prints or something, bring your own like top loaders for that ahead of mm -hmm. time. Um, or bring top loaders for comic books or bring a store folio or a, a shipping box, a small shipping box for comics to store in your backpack to help protect your, your investments. For one thing, it really sucks carrying around like 11 by 17 prints if you like those. So if you have like, if you can find like a canvas bag or, or whatever you have to carry, it makes it a lot easier because they're usually not going to have that at most shows for you in that size uh, sometimes, but you're, you're really asking for it if you if you think you might buy some of those and you don't have that already. At the bigger shows I do, I actually have a cheap Walmart airline carry-on size bag that I take with me to cons to put my stuff in because they'll fit an eleven by seventeen print. They'll also print a ton of they'll also fit a ton of comics, all kinds of stuff. Like, yeah. Guys, deodorant, 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 mouthwash. <laughs> mouthwash was the one that got me. Shower. Carry, carry mints, by the way. If, you, if you're somebody yes. who has bad breath. Or if even... you're going to eat at all during the day and not stop and brush your teeth in the middle of the day, yeah. carry a freaking mint. Everything at conventions has onions. I don't know why. Well, and, but here's the other thing, too. A lot, you know, look, this is real talk. And I, this has happened to me a couple times. I get, there, it, especially early on, there was a couple creators I got nervous around. That doesn't happen to me really anymore. But, but if you're going to your first show, especially that can happen to you. And if you get nervous, things like dry mouth happen, things like sweating happen. You know, those are real talk. I, the first couple of cons I went to, I was also wearing a Well, not the first couple, but the, the primary cons I would do, I was also wearing a mask, which with a beard really made me sweat a lot, too. Um, but yeah, that kind of stuff can really happen. So plan ahead for what that's going to be like and, and kind of anticipate those needs. Right. Um, and here's the other thing. You got those mints. You go up to a creator and they've been talking and talking. Offer them one. Just be polite that way. Because they're feeling their breath and their dry mouth too. Yeah. Um, the last one I really want to I really want to kind of mention and maybe give it some time. The day or two before the con, once the guest list is basically finalized, right? You know who's actually coming and who's not. Who's got conflicts and who's not. You know, you know what your budget's going to be that kind of stuff, sit down and look at the map that they, if they publish a map on the website or online or on social media, look at the map, look at the lists and go in with a plan. Right. Um, right. Know where, know where the, know where the hidden bathrooms are downstairs at C2E2. Um, you know, that kind of stuff, like knowing these little games 
that save you time in the long run. And knowing, like, if you're if you're a a, a an exclusive hunter, knowing who has the exclusives, which exclusives are going to be hot, so you can go to them early. But having a, a, I always called it my you know my my mission, my game strategy, my game plan. You know, the mission should I choose to accept it. <laughs> and I would go in and I'd have my blanks with a post-it note in front of them. This is the blank for this person. This is the blank for that person. This is the book to have signed by this person. And a lot of times what I'll do when I have that plan is I'll take the cash and get a bunch of little envelopes and put them inside the bagging board with the book. So if I know Starenko is charging 50 bucks for a signature and I've got a Starenko book, I can pull it out when I get close to him so I don't have to hold on to it while the whole time I'm in line. I pull out the envelope with the cash. I hand him the book. I open the envelope. I hand him the cash. Done. Right? I don't. That way you don't have to think when you're in front of somebody. Yeah. Uh, the story I will have that really drives us home is last year at Motor City, I went for one purpose, to meet with Bill Daniels, William Daniels, who played Mr. Feeney on Boy Meets World. I got to his booth and I didn't have this all set up. And I got so bum fuzzled by Mr. Feeney. And I didn't want him to talk about Boy Meets World. I want to talk about 1776. That like he asked me what my name was and I forgot for a second. Like, and I don't get starstruck that easy, but this is someone I've followed like. I've been a fan of since I was a very, very small child. It happens. So going in with a plan helps you to be prepared, helps you to get rid of the nerves, and helps you to keep yourself organized. And it usually pays off for the best. It's the, some of the best art I've ever gotten. Some of the best interactions I've ever had with creators are because they knew I was low maintenance because I was prepared. Yeah, just like the Boy Scouts, it, it helps mm -hmm. be prepared. Um one of the one of the final tips I'd give is um, in terms of like, you know, sorry to say this, but hey, a lot of comic book nerds, myself included, are not the most in shape people. If you're not used to walking around a lot, um, maybe do that a few times leading up to the show uh, for the biggest reason. I'll say that because this has happened to me at one show that I will never forget make sure your shoes are like the right walking shoes that you're going to feel good in doing, you know, 10 to 15,000 steps or whatever at a show. Um, because ha there's nothing like getting halfway through a show and having your feet like just killing you. <laughs> it's a real problem. Um, so having the proper footwear is the real tip, but also if you're not used to walking around a bunch, you know, Make sure you're hydrating. Make sure you're walking out. It sounds really simple. It sounds stupid to a lot of people. And a lot of people are so active in their day-to-day -day life. That's not a problem. A lot of comic book people, unfortunately, aren't. Um, so I, I think it's a really good tip is just to make sure that you're ready to go for that kind of experience. Because it's a lot of standing. Most shows I go to, there's hardly anywhere to sit down unless you sit on the floor at the edge of the show or something like that. Um, and even then, a lot of times you're blocking traffic or you can be in the way. And um, it's not like there's a bunch of seating in the, the food court or food area is usually super packed. You got to leave the show if you want to go sit somewhere. Um, it's all those kinds of things. So make sure you're ready for that. The other one I would add to what Bron just said is socks. Yeah. Have the right shoes. Have the right socks. Um, I, style is fine and great. But I, my convention shoes are like the white and blue new balance 502 dad shoes because they are wildly comfortable yep. and your feet feel good. But then like compression socks, I will wear compression socks to a convention all the time um, because it helps my feet not hurt as much. It helps my legs not feel so heavy. It does all of this good stuff that helps you and sure you might look like a dweeb, <laughs> I've never been tired when I've talked to Starenko because I always go see him first. That way I can get my insult meter round up. Before Charge I have to go the rest the of the day. Group. Right. Um, but, you know, um, that, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, and of course, the normal rules, be courteous to people, be nice yeah. to people. Yeah. Um, don't, don't, 
is hard. Try not to fanboy. Try not to lose your mind in front of somebody. Act like you've been there. Act like you know them. Yeah. Simply because everybody else is going to be. If you can have, excuse me, if you can have your crap together, that will serve you better long haul with these creators than if you're, oh my God, I can't believe it, you know. That's true. I mean, some people, some people definitely appreciate that. I mean, on every level, it's nice to be adored or, you know, have somebody sure. gush over you. But I, I mean, there's, there's so many things I've had with creators where it's like the next, you know, like there's people I talked about where they remember that I helped them out with a, with a booth barnacle, like we talked about earlier. Um, those experiences stick with them more. If you have that kind of, you can't force a special connection, but you can put yourself out to the point where you're ready for it. Right. So, um, I get. I just came up with another one because I was looking at the art behind me. Both of these, both of these, that, those there. I never, very well, I should say, I very seldom ever ask a creator to do something specific. Kevin Eastman gets asked to draw Ninja Turtles a thousand times a day. I always let him draw what he wants. Tom Richmond, right here. He gets asked to draw Alfred E. Newman a thousand times a day. So I always go, itch whatever itch needs scratched. Have fun. Do what you want. I don't even care. I just want an original piece of art. And so here I paid for a head sketch. And I got two bodies, two busts, right? Doing a thing. Here I ask for a head sketch. I got an action shot. Right? Like... This guy right here is fully painted. I ask for a head sketch, but I let the artists draw what they wanted to draw on the Good book tip. and they have fun. I have a, I have, it's hanging in the other room. I have a Groot on an Avengers cover from Joe Cooper. And what he did in the Groot was he drew the lines of the tree, but it's actually amazing. If you follow it, the line would draw rocket raccoon in the middle of the Groot tree. Because I go, I'll come back. I gave it to him on Thursday. I go, I'll come back and get it from you Sunday. No big deal. Draw whatever you want. Take your time. And so he did. He spent time and energy on it. And it's one of the coolest pieces I have. So just remember, try and remember that these people are there doing business. And if you can make their business easier or more fun, they're more likely going to pay off. It's more likely going to pay off. Yeah. Yep. So... Um, the last thing, th there's one other tip that I can think of. It's not really a tip. It's another, it's a kind of a mindset thing. And it's one of those things, especially I'm, I keep thinking about Sean. Uh, and, and if anybody's watching and this is, you're thinking about going to your first con this con season. If you don't like crowds or being around a lot of people and you have strategies to deal with that, have those at the ready. I'm not somebody who deals with that. I actually don't have, I, I don't like crowds because I don't, I don't like slow people. I don't like people that block the path. I don't like it for those reasons. It's because I, I hate people in large groups. <laughs> I love individuals. Large groups of people usually suck. Um, and that's just, that's just me. But I know there's people that have actual problems coping with that experience. And if that's you, be prepared to deal with that because it is kind of a shock for a lot of people. Like it's not like a big comic book store, even though in a way it kind of is, but it's a big comic book store that's sometimes got thousands of people and it's like, you know, you're kind of squeezing through people and getting maybe more comfortable with people up close than you're used to. So mm -hmm. that, I've actually had viewers talk to me about that specific issue. So I wanted to bring that up. Right. Uh, and for those people in escape plan, knowing where the exits are, knowing where you can go and hide and a place where your friends know to come and find you. Like if you're there with other people and you deal with that stuff, have a place that says, Hey, um, if I, if you turn around and I'm not there, I'm here. Yeah. Right. That's a good one. Or, you know, this is our meetup. So if we get separated, just go there and we'll meet. Um, like, oh, and that, that goes along with another tip I have, by the way, which is don't plan on your cell phone working. Cause there's a lot of venues that I've been in where I don't, I don't get cell service. Unless you pay an outrageous fee for their Wi-Fi, in which case it's usually slow anyway, you may not mm -hmm. be able to like 
easily call or get a message out if you're that person. Right. Like my rule is like at C2E2, our meetup space is the FedEx office. That's two floors down and kind of tucked away. No, I know. <laughs> well, I would. I'm just kidding. Because, well, usually what happens is they're open on Sunday, too. So, like, I usually go down there about every day and drop stuff off to ship home. Smart. That's a good strategy right there. Right. Uh, having a plan to get your stuff home is always a good strategy. But it's one of those things. If my friends turn around and you know I'm not there, they come to the FedEx office. It's quiet. It's out of the way. You know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, like comic journey don't let artists name their price after they're done it's true most but most artists i've ever dealt with have a price on their table hey i'll do a bust for 150 bucks okay i want a bust here's your 150 if they draw more than that that comes out of their end i already paid so you know that kind of stuff but just have have a have a strategy for if you do get the social anxiety yeah uh, there are certain over the counter products you can take and things you can get prescribed to you that will make your life easier. Don't hesitate, but just know the plan, man. Like motor city. We have a, I have a guaranteed meetup spot where I meet people all the time. It's the same place. It's been for 15 years, you know, it's an easy deal. Um, you know, the other thing is, and Sean, you're getting in the deep end, bro. And this is last. We're going to wrap up after this. Start small. If you have social anxiety, if you struggle with crowds, start with a small con. Go to one in an Elks Lodge or a Moose Lodge or at the Knights of Columbus Hall or a hotel ballroom. Yeah. They're often better shows in some ways. Anyway, depending on what's there, you might might get some better deals or whatever. Sure, but start there. And get used to the patter. Get used to the, I'm going to hand you the money and the product. We're going to do this. We're gonna, this is how it feels. This is what carrying my bag looks like. This is how much walking I'm doing at this show. Imagine what I'm doing in a venue four times this size. Get your feet wet and then jump into the deep end. Yeah. Um. Is there a proper way to ask an artist to do a small sketch or small sketch or small or sketch cards or small sketches? I don't have much space on my walls for bigger sizes. Uh, Curtis, the answer is no. Just ask. Yeah. I know like Comic Journey, actually, I think he does the sketch card thing quite a bit with, mm -hmm. with artists. Um, right. And, I, and it's really becoming more popular. Well, and one thing I'll do is I'll do jam pieces. So I'll take a blank cover and I'll just say, hey, um, I'm asking a bunch of people to do $50 worth of cover art on this. Draw whatever you would draw on this for 50 bucks. And so I get 20 or 30 artists on one sketch, on one cover. Right? Doesn't take up a lot of space, but it gets me a lot of art. Just ask. And some people say, I can't. I'm not doing that this weekend. I'm only doing covers. Or I'm only doing eight and a half by 11s. Or I'm only doing whatever. Okay, fine. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. You. I mean, you did the talking and, and uh, uh, talking it out. As long as you're polite, I don't think you're going to have a bad time with that. Or if you do have a bad time with it, it's probably not your fault. <laughs> you know, some artists just have that uh, that mentality sometimes, and you'll get to know those people. <laughs> oh, there's one thing we should let we should say before we leave. What's that? If it feels like a weird deal, it is a weird deal. Don't do it. Yeah, man, I got that AF15 for you, but you got to go meet me out back. <laughs> That's not what I mean. If you feel like somebody's taking advantage of you, yeah. they are. Yeah. Walk. If you feel like somebody is lying to you, they are. Walk away. If it feels like it's too good to be true, you know, don't. And by the way, along with that, don't be afraid to say, hey, I want to take this out and look at it. I, for some reason, people are hesitant to do that at a show. And I mean, obviously, if we're talking about really expensive books, that's a lot different. Um, but there's, I don't know, like people are, are there's like a thing where they don't want to do that. And I, I admit there's a lot of books I, I won't need to do that for. But there's some where it's like, hey, I want to check this out, you know, talk to the, the person with the booth and just work that out. But like, you know, uh, I discovered, you know, oh, hey, this wasn't the printing I thought it was. It wasn't the version I thought it was, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, you know, there's damage inside that I didn't expect. It's strange how many people don't do that. Yeah, no. Um, 
do that. But like I said, if something just feels sketchy, you don't have to buy. You don't have to spend money. Even if it's something you really want, don't put yourself in a position where you're going to be uncomfortable after the deal is done. Yeah. Um, it, it's just it, the biggest rule is trust your spider senses. You know, Literally. trust your instincts and just go with it. Um, cool. So we'll wrap up uh, Comic Journey. That's a good one. I don't usually start with those guys. I usually start with uh, I've got a list, but I love that idea. Making people competitive. Yeah. So. All right. We will be back next week. And I think we already know what our topic for next week is. Is that right, Browns? I think it may change. but It may change. But at the moment. Uh, so you can start putting your comments in uh, both of our respective discords on this video, sending emails to the experience, whatever you want to do. We are going to talk about what does the comics community mean to you? I love this topic. What part of the comics community do you feel like you're in? And how do you interact with the comics community? Yeah. Um, I'll just tell you guys, it's been no secret. I don't think, I, I think you guys probably have noticed for here a lot. Bronze has definitely noticed. We've talked about it. I am struggling with where I, uh, where I fall into the comics community these days. Uh, I am transitioning between a different parts of this community and I'm struggling with where exactly I fit in. So we want to do a thing where we kind of talk about and define what is and isn't the comics community and where do we all fit? How do we all fit? How do we all interact? So, that is next week's show. As of right now, things could always change. But we will see everybody next week here on Devil's Advocates. Join the party. Head over to our link tree to find all the links for everywhere the experience is all the time.